coming up tonight on VCU Insight. A new form of electronic cigarettes is potentially dangerous for children. A crumbling Brandon Mill landmark is finally set to be renovated. And a local author rewrites famous spooky stories for children's enjoyment. All this and more. VCU Insight starts right now. Good evening and welcome to VCU Insight. I'm Randy Ayala. And I'm Terrence Dixon. Thanks for joining us. Our top story tonight, electronic cigarettes have taken on a new liquid form with a sweet smelling scent that some say is tempting to children. Insight's Matthew Hall is in our newsroom to tell us more. Good evening, Matthew. Good evening, Terrence. Doctors say that these small containers can be potentially dangerous in the wrong hands, little hands, like the ones of your small child. Mother of two children, Stephanie Atkins, brings her kids to e-cigarette shop RVA Vapes at least once every two weeks. Her boyfriend owns the shop. There's all kinds of flavors. I mean, from Nana Pie to dip strawberries. Atkins says that she's aware that the liquid can be dangerous to children if they are left unattended to around the bottles. But she feels that parents have to educate their kids about the danger as well. The liquid is a flavored nicotine that smokers of electronic cigarettes pour into the devices to smoke. However, part of the danger is that sweet smelling flavors such as watermelon yum yum are alluring to children. Experts say the risk is that they could drink the nicotine, which could be toxic or fatal. Dr. Ruddy Rose of the Virginia Poison Control Center said that he has received several calls about accidental poisonings from the e-liquid. But I mean, these products have been out now a couple of years, and so it's, it's now it's, as, as they gain uh, popularity and use, then we will increasingly see calls to the poison centers for accidental exposures. Rose says that these bottles contain up to 40 milligrams of nicotine, and that just four to five milligrams could be extremely hazardous to a child. We have had a couple of children that have gotten enough where they've had to be admitted to the hospital, um, but fortunately, no really bad outcomes. Still. Atkins says she has never run into an issue with her kids around the bottles. At the house, we keep them up high on a shelf. Um, not so much for the kids, but for the dogs. The Food and Drug Administration does not currently regulate the e-cigarettes. Back to you, Randy. Thanks, Matthew. The Henrico teen who died after completing the half marathon in Virginia Beach last month will have a lasting legacy. Family and friends of Cameron Gallagher are now starting a fund in her name to bring awareness to suicide prevention, a cause that was close to her heart before she died. In late March, 16-year-old Cameron Gallagher died moments after crossing the finish line of the Shamrock Half Marathon in Virginia Beach. With no previous health issues, it was devastating to everyone who knew her. It was very shocking. It's not something that you would expect to happen. While still grieving, loved ones decided to take on Cameron's next cause, a run for suicide awareness. One of her close friends is teaming up with the local t-shirt company, Bonfire Funds, to create a t-shirt campaign. Timmerman says creating this memorial fund was the perfect way to do something, not only for Cameron, but her family as it, well. It gave me an opportunity to give back to her family and remember her and her legacy and what she wanted to do for the Speak Up 5K. When you purchase a Cameron Gallagher t-shirt for $20, half of that goes directly to her memorial fund, but Bonfire Funds keeps the other 10 as a base cost. 100% of any additional monetary donations goes to her. Cameron's family has been overwhelmed by the community outreach. I just felt so much gratitude, and my family felt so honored by that. And uh, it just, it's amazing, the, the outreach that, you know, they did for that and, and helping us and helping Cameron's fund. And, and Cameron would have been so happy to know that. It was the beginning of our realization that Cameron's story was much bigger than our own families. Um, to see her friends and family pitch in with this wonderful idea. Cameron died before she could see these plans move forward, but her loved ones are bringing her vision to life and her spirit will live on. She was always able to lift you up when you were having a bad day and she was always able to make you laugh. The Speak Up 5K race is tentatively scheduled for May. So far, over $10,000 has been raised. If you would like to purchase a shirt or donate, visit speakup5k.com. As part of World Water Month, UNICEF has started a special in initiative called the TAP Project. 
The online project is a nationwide campaign to provide children around the world with clean water. UNICEF simply asks that people use their phones to log into unicefTopProject.org and set their phone down for 10 minutes. For every 10 minutes a person does not touch their phone, Giorgio Armani donates one day of clean water to a child in need. So far, the project has got the project has gotten the project has gotten people nationwide to go 200 million minutes without their phone. Have you ever heard of something called slam poetry? If you haven't, you might not be, you might not be the only one. Insights Carter Johnson is in the studio with the members of the Slam Poetry Club at VCU to tell us more about it. I'm here in the studio with slam poets Saeed, Tijan, Thomas, and Joshua Bronstein. Thanks for joining us, guys. So, can you guys explain to some people who might not know, like, what slam poetry is? You want to tell them, Saeed? We can start. Okay. Well, the difference between spoken word and slam is, like, spoken word is just, like, you know, free verse poetry can be, can rhyme, can do whatever you want, really. But uh, slam is the competition aspect of spoken word poetry where you're judged by uh, five random members of the audience based on a score of like zero to 10. Um, zero being like not good, 10 being like the best thing you've ever heard in your entire life. And, uh, and so that's what the, the slam is just the, the competition aspect. And that uh, and it's, and it, an, it's an opportunity pretty much to include non-poets or people who usually don't listen to poetry into the, into the community because otherwise it would be very secluded. It would just be a bunch of people spitting poems to each other. So in order to like bring more people in, you slap the competition tag on it and you pick random people from the street to come judge it, call the competition and people show up. Well, speaking of competitions, congratulations to you guys for placing second in the College Union Poetry Slam Invitational at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, how does it feel to go to a nationwide competition and play second out of 50 teams that showed up? Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a, a great experience. I like to, I like to refer to the whole, the whole thing as, as like a convention of like Green Lanterns because like Green Lanterns always like congregate at like once a year to like recharge their rings, <laughs> and I feel like we all like do that once a year to like recharge our like pens so we can go back to our sectors and like you know write stuff about the things around us. But it's definitely a. Um, a great opportunity to be with like-minded people and um, have talk about the same things or like have the same opinions on things and just see how other people what other people have done with their words pretty much so you guys also took home an award for the most spirited group at the competition how how does getting an award like that what does that mean to you guys uh, well, uh, yeah, we got a spirit of the slam, and it's just—it's really cool. You know how, like Saeed said, like it's—it's it's just like a bunch of a bunch of like-minded people coming together and sharing. And so to have to have the group recognize our team and our university as as the kind of people that they want to foster that creativity and the kind of people who are doing it the right way is—it feels. I mean, it feels really good personally. Like I, I think it's really cool. Yeah. So we have some video of you guys at the um, College Union Poetry Slam Invitational. Um, we've talked a little bit about you guys performing in front of other slam poets, but now we're gonna talk about you guys performing in front of more diverse audiences, audiences that may not have heard this type of speech before. Mm -hmm. And Josh, you just performed at a pretty big event, you know, so how was that to be able to take slam poetry to an audience that may not be used to it? Um, well, I think, uh, I think, you know, slam poetry tends to have, it, I think some people think that it has so, sort of like a stigma around it that poets sound like this and that it has to sound in a certain way or a certain cadence and we call it poet voice. But the, uh, the thing is, I feel like, you know, when you really just break it down and we can just have a conversation and just mm -hmm. talk to each other as people, um, I think like that it shows that you know it's just it's really just another creative way of public speaking mm -hmm. and just another creative way of trying to tell people the truth and yeah. uh, and your truth and your story so I think um, really when we break it down and uh, and stop like calling each other poets and stop saying it's an audience and it's just a person to person then it just becomes a conversation and we we all can gather we gather things from conversations in all of our lives all the time so yeah 
Well, I've been in the studio speaking with VCU students and slam poets Saeed Tijan Thomas and Joshua Bronstein. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, man. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you did really good. <laughs> Thanks, Carter. James Branch Cabell Library on the VCU campus is undergoing renovations. Construction began on the 44-year-old building earlier this month. VCU libraries re received a $50 million budget last year to expand the current building. According to VCU officials, Cabell Library has less space than any other university in the Commonwealth. Overcrowding on the first and second floor is what created the need for bigger space. 90% of this, of this building is designed specifically for students and faculty, not typical library materials. Students can expect access to more group study rooms, computer workstations, and a Starbucks cafe. The renovations will be completed by fall 2015. The crumbling Brander Mill Inn and Conference Center has a new owner after a decade of legal issues. And many local residents are excited about the prospect of future construction plans. Insights' Allison Bauer is in the newsroom with more information. Good evening, Allison. Good evening, Randy. Community members are pleased to see some resolution after all these years. But mostly, people are excited that this eyesore is finally going to be torn down. Brander Mill residents are excited the property that's attracted vandals and negative attention is finally set to be torn down. Washington, D.C.-based developer Holiday Corp. purchased the property earlier this month. Senior Vice President at Commonwealth Commercial Sam Worley worked with Holiday for years to finalize the deal and says it was one of the most difficult he's ever done. I think it's going to be positive because what there is there now is a total wreck. The property was built in 1984, but the trouble started about 10 years ago when the former owner got entangled in a Ponzi scheme, meaning he was part of a fraudulent investment. This led him to bankruptcy and eventually foreclosure. Worley says Holiday was under contract to buy the property for years, but couldn't close the deal until legal ownership was cleared. It had all the elements of being a nightmare, but we got it solved. The property sits on the edge of Brander Mill, which is Chesterfield's largest planned subdivision, with nearly 13,000 residents, 4,000 homes, and 200 commercial properties. The Brander Mill Community Association is working with Holiday to hammer out details on a maintenance and use agreement. This will allow the association continued use of the marina attached to the property. Brander Mill Community Manager John Bailey would not appear on camera but says that members of the community are ready to see the structure torn down and the property put to better use. Uh, it's an eyesore, it's a safety hazard, and it's just a general mess. <laughs> Holiday purchased the property for $1.4 million earlier this month, with plans to turn it into an assisted living facility. A construction date has not yet been set, but all plans must first be approved by the community's Commercial Architecture Review Board before moving forward. Back to you, Terrence. Thanks, Allison. Kings and Minions kicking off the Kings and Minions kicking off the summer season by celebrating its 40th anniversary. The park is getting some exciting new attractions. In celebration of 40 years, Kings and Minions has added some new attractions for people to enjoy. Crowds gathered to watch VCU's pep band, The Peppers, kick off the grand opening early this month by performing a few songs. But all season long, people can see what's been fixed and what's brand new. The floor clock has been completely redone. A walk of memories has been added to show the 40-year history of the park, and a famous talking mushroom has also made a return, thanks to park goers' demands on Facebook. Park officials didn't say how much the total renovations will cost. A faction of the popular TED Talks conference series held its second annual conference on March 28th. It's called TEDx RVA, and it embraces creativity in more ways than one, Insights Carter Johnson reports. The Richmond version of the global conference series TED Talks opened its second annual conference on March 28th to a packed house. The conference's theme, Re with a Blank, provoked both speakers and spectators to use their imaginations to fill in the blank. For speakers like Joshua Bronstein, this meant trying some unconventional methods. He decided to perform an original poem titled Shooting the Messenger, which addresses gun violence in America. Go to the NRA and nail the 95 feces in the front office. Guns don't stop crime. They cause it. He says he was very pleased by the audience's reaction. It's awesome to me that I feel like people are really listening to uh, 
to other forms of speech and other ways of people who are, present, who are expressing themselves. Bronstein was one of 23 performers to take the stage at the event. Richmond native Sophia Whitfield says Bronstein's performance embodies what this year's theme is all about. So he just showed up and did a performance and left you to extract the meaning. TEDx RVA is one of multiple TEDx factions across the country that holds conferences in the style of TED Talks. The conference held here at the November Theater hopes to display Richmond's creativity and innovation. Whitfield is a fan of the TED Talks and waited all year long for the conference. According to her, it was well worth the wait. It just excites me to go wild with just imagination and possibilities. Possibilities that pose a bright future for Richmond. For VCU Insight, I'm Carter Johnson. If you missed the conference, the live stream of all the talks is available at TEDxRVA.com. A VCU student is receiving an award for his involvement in community enrichment. He's also here to discuss a therapeutic method of cooking. Insight's Matthew Hall is in the studio with this inspirational student. I'm here in the studio with VCU student Jensen Larrymore. He's here to discuss his recent accomplishments and new model of cooking. Jensen, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, you're very welcome, Matthew. So, as a result of a motorcycle accident that actually happened about seven and a half years ago, um, it left you paralyzed from the waist down. So can you just tell us about that story and how you've not let that hold you back? Well, sure. I, I was living in Maui at the time, and I got hit by an underage driver who was out having a good time. And uh, it put me into a coma and shattered two vertebrae. My T7 and T8 were burst fractures. And uh, I had to stay in the hospital for two months getting stabilized before I returned back to Richmond, uh, which is where I was born and raised. And also is where I learned and trained as a chef. I had cooked my way out to Maui over a series of years from the age of 20 to 25, slowly traveling west. And, um, you know, that all stopped in a dime. So yeah. once I got back to Richmond and started getting perspective on what I wanted my future to be, I knew that I would have to come back to school. But I knew I needed to learn the skills that I could to become as independent as possible. Gotcha. To do that, I had to lose some serious weight. Um, I was I was I was a heavy guy, and um, you know, I the only thing I could control was what I could put into my body on a on a daily basis. So, I put myself on a whole foods diet. Nothing out of a bag. Nothing out of a box. Uh, no red meat. No refined sugar. Gotcha. And uh, cooked every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Did that for my family as well which gave me an incredible sense of self-worth and, and uh, independence. I learned a lot of skills while I was doing it, yeah. and after 10 months, I had lost 35 pounds. So is that, um, we also have some footage of you now, uh, of you actually in the kitchen throwing something down. So can you tell us really what you're preparing and how that's been therapeutic for you as oh, well? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right here, I'm preparing or, or showing a class in the School of Occupational Therapy how to do basically a chicken wrapped prosciutto with a primavera sauce and basically you can do a meal for four you know in uh, in pretty short time that's all done in one dish essentially so as part of the rehabilitation model especially for people with disabilities you know convenience is an issue safety is an issue but at the end of the day, good food is good food. And if you show people how to cook, you know, it's, it's like the old, uh, the old adage. You, you give a man a fish one day, he eats for one day. You teach a man to fish and he eats for a lifetime. It's the same thing with cooking. And uh, I envision cooking as being a vehicle for rehabilitation for anybody that has a catastrophic event in their life. Now, you're also receiving an award here at VCU, the um, Presidential Award for Multicultural Enrichment and Awareness. So can you just speak about that and what that means for you and a little bit yeah, about what you do with the Absolutely. Uh, well, the, the Pack Me Award has been, you know, uh, an incredible gift, you know. And I'll be receiving that uh, on Wednesday, the 16th. And basically, that's in recognition of the student organization I co-founded and am president of now. Right. We do a Disability Awareness Week every every year in October, where we bring down um, you know 
experts, panel discussions, speaker meetings, yeah. all things that bring attention to disability awareness. Yeah, that's great, that's yeah. great. I've been, I've been speaking with Jensen Larry, Jensen Larry Moore, VCU student. Jensen, thanks for being here with us. It's my pleasure, thank you. So, yeah, so. Thanks, Matthew. A new live music venue opens in Richmond this week. The Broadberry is located on the 2700 block of West Broad Street in the former home of the NU nightclub. The Broadberry is a team effort from Rand Burgess, owner of the Camel, Lucas Fritz, the Camel's event manager, and Matt McDonald of Joe's Inn. The new music venue can accommodate up to 350 people. They plan to have live bands every night of the week. A Richmond chef has just returned from a well-respected cooking experience in New York City. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Magpies Owen Lane. I spoke to him before he left for New York City, and he said he was trying to take a little bit of Virginia to the folks in the Big Apple. Owen Lane, chef and co-owner of the Magpie in Richmond Carver District, was selected to cook at the City Grit in New York City. That restaurant is known for hosting well-known and emerging guest chefs from around the world. Big honor to be uh, selected uh, to represent um, Richmond. Lane says he can't wait to showcase Virginia and all the food the Commonwealth has to offer. I'm doing all Virginia um, based products so I wanted to not just go, go up there and showcase the kind of stuff we do here but I also wanted to showcase the the farms. This dish here is the pulled rabbit. When a chef slings six your dishes that he plans to cook at the city grip also he plans to cook a five-course meal. Kira Sadell is a regular customer that comes to the Magpie at least once a week. She says Chef Lane creates dishes that she has never seen before. It's a restaurant in Richmond that consistently brings like innovative, really great food. And uh, he takes great ingredients that I haven't seen on other menus and does a very nice job of having consistent, delicious food. As for Chef Lane, he says there are no barriers to his food creations. I don't think there should never be any type of limitation on what you should be able to do with food. It's, it's, your, it's, it's our canvas and we're going to paint however the hell we want. Lane is the third chef to be selected from Richmond. The other two came from the Roosevelt and the Rappahannock restaurants. I think we're all in for a, a big shift here pretty soon of what the city is really going to be. And chef Lane says the trip was a great experience and he made a lot of connections. April 15th marked the one-year anniversary of Boston Marathon bombings. The two bombs exploded at the finish line, killing three and injuring over 260 others. Many events were planned for the anniversary, including a walk to the finish line and laying wreaths at the site of the explosion. This year's marathon takes place on April 21st. According to New York Times, more than 3,500 police officers will be present, double from last year. The Virginia Historical Society is collecting book donations for its annual book sale on Saturday, June 15th. Soft and hardcover books of all genres are accepted, though the museum asks that they be in good condition and have a historical connection. Books may be donated at the museum shop during regular business hours, Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. All books will be sold at discounted prices during the summer book sale and proceeds will be used to benefit Virginia Historical Society educational initiatives. At filing tonight, it might sound unlikely, but Edgar Allan Poe's books are getting a, a new life as children books. A local author has released his first book to introduce children to Poe's works. Insights' Erica Rivas has more on the Lil Poe book series. What began as a joke to entertain friends somehow turned into a serious project for author Micah Edwards. He has always been a big fan of Poe's scary tales, but thought they could be too scary for children. So he decided to change that with the creation of his first Little Eddie book, titled Ricky's Spooky House. The stuff he writes is black and compelling and grips you. I mean, he's just a master of horror, which is obviously not what you want in a children's book. Edwards has shared the book with friends who have kids, and he says he's received positive reviews. Though Edwards does not see his book as being a replacement or a threat to post stories, there are still people who approach any rewriting with caution. Kirk Richardson is an English professor at VCU. He has a deep appreciation for Poe's works and created a virtual walking tour, which documents Poe's last day in Richmond. 
He believes rewriting any of Poe's works is a difficult task for anyone to tackle. Very, very rarely is it done well. And I think that that would really be my, um, my yardstick for whether it, I like it or not. However, Richardson has yet to read Edward's book. He says he looks forward to doing so as soon as it hits stores. Edwards is aware there will be people that will love or hate his book, but he hopes they realize this project is not to be taken too seriously. It's a terrible thing to do to Poe if you take it seriously. It is, however, I think an extremely funny way for parents to introduce their children to Poe. For VCU Insight, I'm Erica Rivas. Edward's book is available at his website and will be available for download as an ebook next month. If sales go well, he plans to rewrite more of Poe's work as children's books. Wow, you know, that book is, sounds really interesting. I mean, I don't know if I would buy it because it's kind of, Edgar Allan Poe is a little scary. Yeah, if I had kids, I'm not really sure I would go for it, but hopefully it goes well for him. Yeah, I hope it goes well for him too. Well, that's it for this edition of BCU Insight. Make sure to check out our website at insight.bcu.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under VCU Insight. Contact us with any stories you'd like to see on our show. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Terrence Dixon. And I'm Randy Ayala. We'll see you next time.